We're going to start by talking about vector equality. So what does it mean for two vectors to be equal? So first of all, you need to have the same dimensions. So you need to have the same dimensions. So let's look at uh, two vectors, u and v in R2. <clears throat> so u could be a, a, b. And v will be c, d. So what does it mean to say that u is the same as v? So what that means is the coordinates match up. So if I should equal when their coordinates are the same. All right, the next, and we're gonna be getting into some word problems. So static equilibrium is another uh, important idea. So what is static equilibrium? This happens when all forces add up to the zero vector. So if you have two or three forces, or our problems won't have more than three forces in them, but if your two or three forces all add up to B zero, what that means is the, force, the forces are canceling each other out. So you think of a tug of war where two sides are perfectly equal, they're pulling the exact same amount opposite directions, so what happens? Really, nothing moves. So that's called static equilibrium. And the other idea we're going to need is polar coordinates. So polar vectors. Now, you've done two sections in polar coordinates already. You did complex numbers in polar coordinates and um, regular points in polar coordinates. So there's no difference with vectors, really. You cannot use that uh, really useful Euler notation. So polar vectors, there's only really one choice in notation. Uh, so our vector, normally we would be using uh, x, y. But what we're going to use now instead is an r and a theta. So our notation, if you had x, y, what's going to look like now? So where in the world did r cos theta come from? Well, x is r cos theta. And what is y? r sine theta. So that's exactly where these come from. Really nothing new here at all. So polar coordinates work exactly the same way they did before. And there is one thing you can do with the R here. You can bring it outside. Like that. So you can factor out the magnitude or the radius, whatever you like to call it. Uh, and then you have this. Uh, the best way to think about that is a direction vector. So it just points you, hey, we're going to point in this direction, determined by theta. And before we get started, let's uh, compute the magnitude of this direction vector. So we compute magnitude. It's a square root. The x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared. And what is cos squared plus sine squared? Well, it doesn't matter what theta is. That always adds up to 1. And square root of 1 is 1. So the magnitude of the direction vector is always 1. So it is a very useful way to write things. You just get the direction here, and then the 
distance or the radius tells you how far to go that direction. All right, our examples here are gonna use all these concepts. So first, we'll do a polar coordinates. Uh, find the direction angle of a vector. And magnitude. And we use our vector uh, four, negative four. All right, direction angle and magnitude. Let's get the magnitude first, usually a little easier. Magnitude. So it's written like absolute value, but is not the absolute value. We're going to square root both of the coordinates added together. So we got four squared plus four squared. Now you could write that 16 plus 16 is 32, but let's try to avoid some of these big numbers. So this is two times four squared, and we're gonna bring the four squared outside the square root, just like that. So this is four square root two, that's our magnitude. All right, angle. So we still, of course, have the uh, tan theta is y over x. We can absolutely go this route. So y is negative 4, x is positive 4. Now, because x is positive, uh, my tangent inverse will give us the angle we want. When the x is negative, then you're going to have to add a half rotation to your angle. All right, what type of angle? has a tangent value of negative four over four. Well, negative four over four, those are not sides I'm used to. Let's reduce this fraction. I can reduce it to negative one. So let's say it's still not ringing a bell. A very useful thing to do is graph. So let's really quickly graph this vector. Go over four, down four, And there's our vector. So we got our magnitude already, but what I really want to know is this angle theta. And we're halfway, we're halfway from zero to pi over two. So what we have is, pi, well, negative pi over two. So we're going to go negative pi over four. And there is our direction angle, and our magnitude is up here. So those are the two pieces we need. And if I wanted to write this vector in polar coordinates, I could write it, I'll write it with the radius outside. And then cosine is first for the x coordinate, comma y coordinate is sine. And you may be very tempted to uh, keep going here. Oh, well, I know cosine negative pi over 4 and sine negative pi over 4. All right. That's 1 over square root 2, comma, negative 1 over square root 2. And we distribute this across. We're going to have 4 square root 2 over square root 2, comma, negative 4 square root 2 over square root 2. Those fractions cancel out, they're both one. So going from polar coordinates back to rectangular is super easy. Now, that's where we started. So I just wanted to show you what would happen if you actually go ahead and evaluate those two trig functions. You'll be back in rectangular coordinates uh, right away. As if you see on the second step, there's no more thetas here. So it's really not, it's not really written in polar coordinates anymore. There's no more angles. So now we're going to do uh, do two word problems. The second one's going to be a, quite a bit more tricky. So let's start out with an easier one. And this is going to be about an airplane flying in some wind. Uh, 
an airplane maintains a constant airspeed of 500 miles an hour. And is traveling, heading due south. Now there's a wind, and the wind is the jet stream, and it's 80 miles per hour in the northeastern direction. Going to use MPH, Z miles per hour in the northeast direction. So I want to know what is the uh, ground speed and the direction of the airplane. So first we're going to find the velocity vectors. So find the velocity vectors of the airplane and the jet stream. And afterwards we want to find the actual speed, ground speed and direction. Now, depending on how strong the jet stream is, it can have a really serious effect on the uh, actual motion of the airplane. Just like if you're swimming in the ocean and there's a very strong current, you know, if the current's gonna pull faster than you can swim, then it doesn't matter. Uh, you're swimming, you're gonna be actually moving the opposite or the wrong way. So if your jet stream or the current uh, is stronger or faster than the, then you can travel, then it will basically control where you're gonna go. So in this case, our airplane flies way faster than the jet stream, but it's still gonna have an effect. So let's go ahead and find the velocity vectors of the airplane and the jet stream. And what we're gonna do is graph these out. So the airplane's heading 500 miles per hour due south. We'll use some fun colors. Wow, it's a bad straight line. All right, this is a vector and I'll call this VA for the aircraft vector. Now our jet stream is much shorter and it's going in the northeast direction. So northeast is this direction and it's only 80, so it's not very long. And we'll use VJ for jet stream. So there's the aircraft's going south, heading south, but our jet stream's pushing it a little bit eastward, and it's also gonna slow it down a tiny bit. So what we wanna know is uh, what are the actual coordinates of these vectors? So let's go with the easier one first, VA. All right, so this is in two dimensions. So our first, our x coordinate, how much are we moving in the horizontal direction? The answer is we're not moving, the jet is not moving at all in the horizontal direction. It's only going uh, in the vertical direction. So we got zero there. Now in the vertical direction, it looks like it should be 500, but it's pointing downwards. So we're going with negative 500. Now for the jet stream velocity, this is gonna be a little more tricky 
I know the magnitude and I know the direction. So the magnitude is 80, 80 miles per hour. I just need to figure out what is this angle theta right here. So this is a northeast direction. So without any more details, we're going to assume it is directly between the north and the east. So 45 degrees if you're a degree person, or pi over four if you're a radian person. So we're gonna go with the pi over four direction. In polar coordinates, this is gonna look like r cos theta sine theta. Our radius is 80. Cos pi over four sine pi over four. And we do want to evaluate this. So this is one over square root two, comma one over square root two. And if I distribute my 80 across, so that's the jet stream velocity vector. So that's part one. Now we're gonna get into part two. So with respect to the ground, relative to the ground, the airplane, we have to take into account both of these two vectors. So how do we do that? We're going to uh, basically add them together. And what we're gonna get when we add them together. Uh, now visually, I showed you how to add these two vectors together. So we could do, we could just compute that number. But visually, what does addition look like visually? This is called head to tail addition. So addition is head to tail. So I'm gonna take this velocity vector right here and I'm gonna line it up so it is right at the end of the VA of the other velocity vector. So there's VJ. So the way you add vectors visually is you do the first vector, you go across the first vector, and then you go across the second vector. Let's get a better color, or another color out here. Let's use the highlighter. So I'm gonna go across this first vector. Orange, that'll work. So we're gonna go across the first vector here, and then we're gonna go across the second vector. And what we're going to end up with is a single vector that's right there. And let's call this VG for the ground speed, or the ground velocity. So VG is VA plus VJ. Now you might be tempted to subtract these vectors, uh, but remember we're not taking two points and finding a vector between them. What we wanna do is find the total effect of both vectors. So we're gonna add up both of their uh, coordinates. So we got VA is zero, negative 500, plus, 80 over square root two, 80 over square root two. So adding these is relatively straightforward. Zero plus 80 over square root two is 80 over square root two. And the second coordinate will be 80 over square root two minus 500. So this is the velocity with respect to the ground. So if you were watching it from the ground, this is how fast, this is the uh, velocity it would appear to have. And I wanna know the speed and the heading. So speed is the magnitude of velocity. So I need to get the magnitude of this vector. So our speed here will be the magnitude of this vector.
Now this is going to be a, an ugly number if we actually computed it. So what I'm going to do is just write it down and not go through computing this. I, I don't even feel like squaring 80, although that's certainly not the hardest part of this problem. And that's good enough for us. This is the speed. If I wanted to uh, try to go a little further, you want to make sure in this right here, you're going to FOIL because you're squaring a uh, two terms subtracted. So make sure you would FOIL that. All right, how do I get the angle, the heading angle? So I think I used data up here somewhere. Yep, so let's use phi. And of course, I just wrote a theta. All right, this will be arc tangent or tangent inverse. of y over x. So y will be this right here. It's divided by our x is 80. There's not too much you can do to simplify this down. Uh, one thing to pay attention to, the x coordinate was already positive, so I don't have to do the uh, add a half rotation, which is nice. My arc tangent just gives me the value I'm looking for. I can clean this fraction up a tiny bit. I can multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator. So we're going to get 1 minus 500 square root 2 over 80. Uh, let's see. I'll reduce this by 10 right here. Or factor out 10 and cancel. Uh, I can reduce this a tiny bit more, but that's pretty good right there. Good enough. So there's our arc tangent, uh, which will give us our theta value. Okay, last problem in this section is a word problem. And we have a box suspended from the ceiling by two cables, as in the diagram I'm about to draw. And the box weighs 1,200 pounds, and I want to find the tension in the cables. So this is a static equilibrium problem you don't see the word static equilibrium, but this word right here, suspended, uh, means this box is not moving. So it's gonna have two cables attached to the ceiling, and those two cables are set up in a way so that the box is not moving. So here's our diagram. That angle on the left is 30, the one on the right is 45. Here's our box, 1,200 pounds. And I want to know how much tension is in each cable. So obviously there's going to be a, quite a bit of tension in each cable. So this is what the setup looks like. What I'm going to do is redraw this in a uh, what's called a free body diagram, which is the way that uh, you're going to sketch things out to figure out forces. So it's called a free body diagram. It's about one of the least artistic ways to draw, but the major advantage it has is it simplifies things down so that you very clearly see what the vectors are. So here's the box. You draw a the body, in this case the box, as a point, not very exciting. 
All right, we got to write down all the forces. So we got a big force for gravity right here. I'll go FG, force of gravity. There is two other forces. There's one force in the rope on the right side and the other force in the rope on the left side. And the way we're going to draw those forces, there's one force. Actually, I should be angled up a little more. And the other force is going to go in that direction. Now I'm just going to call this uh, F1 and F2 for the first force and the second force. So what I need to do now is write a coordinate axis. So there's the x-axis. could draw the rest of the y-axis, but that's probably good enough. The reason I'm doing this is because I need to label some angles in a normal way here. So we'll go with theta1 and theta 2. So we need to figure out what is theta 1, what is theta 2. So theta 1, depending on how much high school geometry you had, theta 1 would be measured on the original right here. And if you extend this line for the box out, these angles right here are something like alternate angles uh, but the intuition you can use is they're the same angle so they're both going to be 45 degrees theta 2 it's a little bit more tricky it's not 35 degrees so there's theta 2 so it's way bigger than 30 degrees. So how does 30 degrees fit into this? Well, that angle right there is 30 degrees. And this would be, you could think of this as a reference angle for theta two. So what is theta two? Theta two is going from uh, zero up to here. And of course we went all the way, it's 180. So theta two has to be 150. So we got theta 1 and theta 2. The reason I had to measure them in the regular way is because we're going to be applying sines and cosines to these, and they have to be uh, treated in the same way we always treat sines and cosines. OK, so let's write out what all these forces actually are. We'll go from the easiest one, so force of gravity. We have 0 in the x direction and 1,200 downwards, so that's negative 1,200. So that's FG, F1. I don't know the magnitude. So what I'm going to do is write M1. So M1 is the magnitude of the first force. M2 is the magnitude of the second force. I don't know what they are, but I'm going to quantify them. These are the these two forces are the tensions in the two ropes. So force one is the magnitude of that force multiplied by the direction vector, which is cos 45 degrees sine 45 degrees. And F2 is really similar. It's the second magnitude multiplied by the direction, which is cos 150 sine 150. So cos 45, sine 45, those are both 1 over square root of 2. Now over here we have to be careful, we're not in quadrant 1, so we're going to have a negative x coordinate. And we'll go back here. So what's our x coordinate going to be? So that'll be negative square root of 3 over 2, and our y coordinate will be positive 1 half. All right, so those are our three forces. We need this box to not be moving, so static equilibrium is what we need. So 
So all three forces add up to the zero vector. Now I'm going to write the zero vector on the left side, actually. So we'll go zero equals those three. Now I know I'm in two dimensions, so I can write my zero vector as zero comma zero. And I'm just going to write out my three forces. And at the same time, I'm going to distribute my magnitudes in here. Two, we have negative square root three over two m two comma one half m two. All right, let's go ahead and add these together. So we're adding our x coordinates first. So we got zero. Plus m one over square root two minus square root three over two m2 comma negative 1200 plus m1 over square root 2 plus 1 half m2 and this ugly vector equals 0 0 so here we have vector equality what does it mean for a vector to be equal that means the x coordinates are the same and the y coordinates are the same so we really are looking at two equations here, an x equation and a y equation. So our x equation, we got on the left side zero equals, I'm not gonna write the zero plus, we'll just start with m1, and I wanna write my fraction notation consistent. So I'm gonna write as one over square root two, m1 minus square root three over two, m2. Our y equation is 0 equals negative 1200 plus 1 over square root 2 m1 plus 1 half m2. So we've got an x equation and a y equation. Two equations, two variables. These are also linear equations. <clears throat> which are the easiest types of equations to solve. And there's two main ways to do it. There is a substitution or elimination. It looks like I could probably use elimination pretty easily to knock out M1. Uh, or I could just as easily go with substitution. Let's do substitution. So what I'm going to do is solve for now normally I would just solve for m1 but what I'm going to do instead I'm going to solve for uh, 1 over square root 2m1 and you'll see why in a minute it's very easy to do this all you do is add square root 3 over 2 to the other side or square root 3 over 2m2 two so you just add this term to the other side, and you solve for 1 over square root 2 on 1. So why do we do this? Well, you're substituting here. So you're taking where you see 1 over square root 2 on 1. You're going to substitute that whole thing out. And in its place, we're going to put square root 3 over 2 on 2. Now we got one equation and one unknown. We can hopefully solve this. Add 1200 to both sides and factor out m2 at the same time. And then just divide by that. Ah, fraction of fractions. That's annoying. I could do a common denominator. In the, uh, in the denominator, which is easy to do. It's already common denominator. And now multiply by the reciprocal of that denominator. All right. 
right, so that is M2. So that's one of the two uh, parts of the answer I wanted. That's the tension in the second cable. Now with the tension in the first cable, how do I get that? Well, I know M2, so we're just gonna solve for uh, M1 right here. So I'm rewriting this equation. Solving all the way for M1 now. Multiply by square root two. We know this M2 value right here. So we're gonna plug that in. Square root two times square root three is square root six times 2400 square root three plus one M2. So 2400 divided by 2, 1200 times square root 6 over square root 3 plus 1. Something went wrong. Ah, I plugged in the M2 value, but kept writing M2. All right, so this is the uh, tension in cable number 1. And that is our last word problem. So we got our two tensions and that will put it into static equilibrium.